It is with immense joy that I welcome everyone this evening to the Faculty of Philosophy's second installment of our newly launched annual lecture in Christian philosophy at St. Patrick's Pontifical University. This lecture was launched last April with our inaugural lecturer, William Desmond, who should be here shortly, hopefully. And I'm happy to say, or I was going to be happy to say that he was sitting in the audience, but uh, he'll, I'm sure he's coming. This inauguration was done in concert with the Future of Christian Thinking Conference, which saw close to 20 of many of the leading figures in Christian philosophy and theology writing today descend upon our venerable and beautiful campus. With over 120 participants coming from across continental, continental Europe, America, and the UK to attend. This event was a great success, and the Faculty of Philosophy is in discussion as when to shoot the sequel, so to speak. So, so please stay tuned. But in the time between, things are not laying fallow, as this year our annual lecture in Christian philosophy is being given in tandem with an open workshop on analogy, desire, and imitation. This workshop is being put on in connection to my grant received from the two million pound Widening Horizons in Philosophical Theology Project, run out of the University of St. Andrews by Professor Judith Wolfe and funded generously by Templeton Religion Trust. Many of you attending the lecture this evening are also here for the workshop. Thank you for coming and a heartfelt welcome. That said, I cannot think of any better way of launching this event than with a speaker, thinker, and friend very dear to my heart, Cyril O'Regan. Professor O'Regan is the Catherine F. Huskin Professor of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. Professor O'Regan's work is as expansive as it is deep. His areas of focus can be said to be systematic theology, historical theology, as well as continental philosophy, especially the latter's intersection with theology. Implicated in the aforesaid triptych, Professor O'Regan has done substantial work on 19th century theology and philosophy, specifically, but by no means exclusively, Hegel and the Tübingen School, along with extensive treatment of postmodern thought and the theological turn in French phenomenology. Speaking of the theological turn, when working on this intro, I saw that Professor O'Regan had just written a superb foreword to Emmanuel Falk's newest book, By Way of Obstacles. Incidentally, I am happy to say that Emmanuel Falk will be giving this lecture in 2025. Returning to Professor O'Regan, this is to mention nothing of his work done on mysticism, apocalyptic, Gnosticism, and Gnostic return. Some of the Catholic figures with which Professor O'Regan is particularly engaged include Newman, Du Lubac, Hansers von Balthasar, and Benedict XVI. Professor O'Regan burst on the scene in 1994 with the appearance of the heterodox Hegel, a text which gives pious Hegelians nightmares and sweats, and always, in my view, needs to be read in tandem with William Desmond's Hegel's God, a Counterfeit Double. Now you have the answer to the famed and ever-present riddle of how many Irishmen does it take to exercise Hegelian Geist, for the answer is two. <laughs> Following this work comes the appearance of two volumes of his Gnostic Return series, namely Gnostic Return in Modernity, 2001, and Gnostic Apocalypse, Jakob Boma's Haunted Narrative, 2002. The next two books signal O'Regan's ever-intensifying apocalyptic turn as seen in Theology and Spaces of Apocalyptic, 2009, and The Anatomy of Misremembering, Balthazar's Response to Philosophical Modernity, Volume 1, Hegel, in 2014. And I am told that the hope is that Volume 2, which treats Balthazar's response to Heidegger, should be sent into the publishers this autumn. There are also rumors, 
that a timely book on Newman and Ratzinger is in the workings. This evening, if I'm allowed to prophesize, I see a curtain drawn back through which is glimpsed something of the magnificent and dramatic thoughtscape that volume two of Mr. Membrane promises to be, seeing that the title of the lecture reads The Later Heidegger, Philosophy, Myth, and Revelation. Please join me in welcoming Professor Cyril O'Regan. First, I am delighted to be here, or rather that should be second. Uh, I'm delighted to be here, and, and first, I was delighted to get the invitation. So the two things sort of are connected, but not the same thing. Uh, I want to thank Philip. Um, Philip is a person of extraordinary energy, matched by his generosity, and introduction uh, is another example of the latter. So let me get about my business. You have a handout, uh, and the handout you have bears some resemblance to the talk that I'm going to give. In fact, a relatively decent amount of resemblance, more nearly in the introduction and in opening part one. Part one really is the meat of the matter, uh, dealing with Heidegger and trying to analyze the relationship between myth and philosophy, or the confusion, or the conflation, or they're shuffling back and forth in that discourse. Um, so if you look at part one, there are really three elements to it, and I'll introduce them sort of you know, as we go along. The second part is not going to get an equal rendering. Given this sort of you know, is more a philosophy lecture, uh, I thought I could have sort of a theological reply, but not a theological reply such that sort of it really overcomes the balance of the paper, sort of you know, which is a philosophy paper. My initial training was in philosophy, so I think I can do and I don't need sort of you know, to uh, duck and cover uh, with the theologians. Well, that's what I say. Uh, we'll see what you think afterwards. In the modern period, Christianity has had to contend with multiple challenges and multiple kinds of challenges to its pivotal concept of revelation. For atheists and materialists, the signified reality is as illusory as the concept is bogus. For semi-rationalist theorists as such as Locke, revelation provides a jump start for rational thinking that in due course will catch up with it and surpass it. For Kant, revelation is at once an embarrassment with regard to thought, while providing a clue with regard to sorting out apparatus in ethical theory and with German idealism, revelation comes to be regarded as a reality and concept that in a sense gives rise to philosophical thought, but also is superintended by it, and at least in one case, and that of course is Hegel, fully translated by it. The philosophical work of Martin Heidegger in the first half of the 20th century um, certainly seems to me to be admissible to be added to the list. Clearly, or certainly, we can see in the Heidegger of being in time and before, the determined attempt to relativize what is, the most, funda what is most fundamental about Christianity by insisting that its existential stances and deep questioning at best provide clues to the articulation of a fundamental ontology that is more comprehensive and operates at a more fundamental level of radicality. This is the area of Heidegger's thought that has been brooded, researched, adopted, adapted, and resisted. What, however, about the status of revelation in the strange mythopoetic world of Heidegger's texts of the 1930s and 1940s that shimmer with religiousness, even if it excludes determinate forms of religion and most certainly seems to exclude Christianity. If the short answer to this question is that in this embrace of philosophy and myth, 
revelation is a casualty and in fact is excised, the longer, rather long, the longer, more satisfying answer must attend to how this occurs, what's the process by which it occurs, and yet how even in this excision features of revelation continue to appear. Thus the first of my two tasks, and the major task, which proceeds in three steps. The first step is to inquire into the opening of myth in the Heidegger of the 1930s and 40s, and lay out the five features in and through which revelation is excised. The second examines the nature and form of Heidegger's mythopoesis, and the third involves a compare and contrast between Heidegger's treatment of revelation via the myth and philosophy and that of German idealism, which represents a segue to the second of my two tasks. And this is to inquire into how Christian thinkers have, should, and could reply to this Heidegger on the topic of revelation and its relation to myth and philosophy. Three features in particular stand out, not all of which I will give so there's a fulsome account. First, revelation has a relative integrity and cannot be squeezed out, as is the case in Heidegger, by myth or philosophy or the relation. Second, revelation not only enjoys relative independence from myth and philosophy, it is at once superior to each and also to their point of integration. And third and relatedly, revelation provides the measure, and it is the instrument of critique of both. This is where Augustine, consistently maligned by Heidegger, is given a chance to answer back, which is a professionally polite way of speaking of the very Irish idiom of back answering. I take as my text, The City of God, and specifically books six to 10, which deal with natural and mythic theologies, thus philosophy and myth, and that critiques both from the vantage point of revelation. And with that introduction, let me begin, and specifically with the first of the three features, now in part one, that is opening to myth. While it is easy to point to the shift from Dasein to Sein in Heidegger's work and to distribute the text accordingly with being in time and the Kant book belonging to the former and major texts such as mindfulness and contributions to philosophy belonging to the latter, it has proved more difficult to nail down criteria for the so-called turn in Heidegger that would justify speaking of a rupture between two fields of text production such that one can reliably speak of a Heidegger I and a Heidegger II after the manner of the distinction between the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus and the Wittgenstein of the Philosophical Investigations. Interpretation is divided into contending parties with many Heidegger scholars upholding the classic view of rupture advocated by the likes of Lovett and Richardson, but others most forcibly, Lawrence Hemming, arguing against the rupture thesis insisting that Heidegger's works of the 1930s and 40s are regulated in the last instance by phenomenology, albeit a form that has taken a hermeneutic turn. I do not aim to resolve or even partially adjudicate the debate here, since no matter how important the debate in principle is, from a pragmatic point of view, resolution is not necessary given my more modest agenda, but not entirely modest agenda, of describing the appearance of myth in the text of the 1930s and 40s with a view, A, to understanding what, the re what is the relationship between myth and philosophical thought as Heidegger conceives it, and B, tracking the process of the editing out of Christianity from being in time to contributions in other works with a view to isolating the operations of excision, substitution, and elision though the second two, substitution and elision, are perhaps specifiers of the first. 
If we simply att attempt to describe the emergence or appearance of myth in the works of the 1930s and 1940s uh, in their broadest expanse, but centrally, but centered mainly on contributions and Heidegger's commentaries on the poetry of Hölderlin, we can isolate five elements. And I begin, you have the five elements listed, I begin with the first, the limning of myth. First and foremost, Heidegger's post-metaphysical investigations come to operate significantly in a mythic register, with respect to which the fourfold serves as both summary and synecdoche. The fourfold of two pairs, earth and sky, divine and human, serves as a topos or place of orientation for human beings defined by openness to the core of being, made even more mysterious by being crossed out and otherwise also replaced by the more archaic design, spelled with a Y. Of course, what Heidegger seems to recall here is a world of hierogamy, whose flora and fauna are, subse are subsequently described in meticulous detail by phenom phenomenologists of religions such as Mercy Eli Eliade. Notably, however, in contrast to Eliade, in Heidegger, hierogamy is more formal and does not seem to indicate, as it usually does in mythic thought, gendered relation, something exposed and contested as the exclusion of the feminine by Luce Irigare. The world of the fourfold is a world of differences, but unlike Platonism and in contrast to Judaism and Christianity, it does not suppose a ground of the world that is not the world. However mythic, there is nothing outside the world. The plane of the world, the plane of the world is imminent and allows for variegated experiences, predominantly horizontal, but marked by, shall we say, vertical bulges in the economy of, of appearances. Second, mythic thinking as measure. As introduction to metaphysics, as well as other texts from the 1930s and 1940s intimate, both pre-Socratic philosophy and Greek tragedy approximate to, while not being identical with, the modality of mythic or archaic thinking to which Heidegger alludes and which, he is all, and which he also recommends as the measure by which we evaluate and ultimately condemn the history of philosophy precisely as the history of metaphysics. Heidegger's account of the history of philosophy is, as we all know, essentially reductive. In fact, sometimes it amounts to a set of dashes and hyphens, as he plies his more or less univocal story of four, which nonetheless is divided into the pre-modern and modern regional arcs and streams. There are, however, also figures and discourses and forms of thinking that lie outside or to the side of such a meta-narrative. For example, Greek tragedy and the gnomic wisdom of Heraclitus in the ancient world, Eckhart and Angelus Silesius in the Christian world, and approximately Hölderlin is an exception in the fold of modern thinking, which for the most part Heidegger thinks represents the apotheosis of the Cartesian and or epistemological turn. At one level, Heidegger wants to speak to a beginning of genuine thinking, that is, historically prior to Western philosophy as founded by Plato. On the other hand, however, he wants to speak, as the black notebooks intimate time and again, to a beginning that is not a historical beginning, but rather an immemorial principle of thought and existence, which though always and everywhere betrayed, functions as a lure for thought, as well as an anamnesis of what truly ecstatic thinking could be and how thinking could co-respond to the emergence of reality that presses and compels thinking. And third, again, you will find this sort of in your handout, the centrality of Hölderlin. In the post-Enlightenment field, in the ever more pervasive and deepening of productionist modes of thinking, sourced by the habit of enframing. For Heidegger, it is 
Hölderlin, the German romantic poet who stands out as a model for an alternative form of existence, at once ecstatic and open to the deliverances of being as a vent that expropriates human existence for a mission that in all respects is perpendicular to the grain of intention of the modern world. If the construction of Hölderlin as prophet and his discourse as a cry for prophetic disposition in the flattened world is obvious, there's also no dearth of apocalyptic insinuation in Heidegger's echoing of the German poet's call to arms, in that Hölderlin is talking about a particular way of seeing as well as a particular way of existing, and more particularly a kind of blind seeing and non-seeing which unites blindness and insight. Obviously, it helps Heidegger's case enormously that Hölderlin is so fixated on ancient Greece and on Pindar and Greek tragedy in particular. Each represents a mode of thinking otherwise than the philosophical tradition. And if Hölderlin represents a repetition of both, that is Pindar and Greek tragedy, Heidegger then represents a repetition of a repetition. Of course, in the case of Hölderlin and Heidegger, we're neither talking about repetition being exact nor being genetic. We're not talking about cause. Repetition in both cases is not identical. And besides, there is no causative relationship between these Greek forms of thinking and the thinking of Hölderlin and Heidegger, which are, in a strict sense, eventual in a strict sense. That is, in the way in which Heidegger thinks that there is no precedent or anticipation of Hölderlin, despite the fact that he's reading Hölderlin. In the end, there's no precedent with, res with respect to Heidegger either. For present purposes, we don't need to inquire into the probity of Heidegger's readings of Hölderlin's elegies, odes, and Pindar-like songs of praise, nor question the mode of interpretation which has variously been diagnosed as ahistorical and monolithic, and exclusionary, especially regarding both Hölderlin's death, debts to the Enlightenment and to Christianity. Perhaps more important to note in this later phase of Heidegger's literary production is how his elevating of Hölderlin goes hand in hand with the diminishment of the claims of Nietzsche, who, albeit with a little reserve and maybe, maybe a little prick of conscience, is written back into the history of metaphysics. Fourth, Christianity under erasure. Relatedly, in Heidegger's conjugation of the relation between myth and philosophy in, in the contributions, as well as, as his counter doxographical interpretations of pre Socratic thinking and his elucidations of Hölderlin, or even, or even in his interpretation of Nietzsche, we can speak confidently of the erasure of Christianity. We can leave open, at least for the moment, whether one is talking about substitution for Christianity by a non-philosophical form of thought regarded as more primordial than it, or of an elision of Christianity into myth to the extent to which in Heidegger's articulation of hierogamy as the sphere of the holy seems to show features of revelation such as event, prophetic mission, and eschatological expectation. For now, however, it is sufficient to observe on the one hand, Heidegger's studied avoidance with regard to speaking of Christianity in his published works of the period, and his equally studied preference for original Greek thinking that presents a world uncontaminated by dualisms, by the dualism particularly sponsored by Christianity, but also exhibited in the thinking of the philosophical tradition, which quickly thinks itself into cul-de-sacs to which the commitment to reason leads it. To elevate a thinking poet, a dictator, such as Holden, means that he represents an alternative to both in what he is himself and in his recovery of the voices of Greek tragedy, Pindar and Heraclitus. This, a priori in turn, has consequences in and for Heidegger's interpretation of the great German poet. For example, 
Heidegger simply passes over in silence Helen's evocations of biblical figures, Christ, Mary, John of Patmos, Christian liturgy, bread and wine, Christian apocalyptic, Patmos. And if we are to follow Jean de Marion, the intimations of the Trinity given in Hodelin's reflections on the father-son relationship and also the ministrations of the Holy Spirit. Of course, this is not the only silence enacted in Heidegger's interpretation of Hodelin. Heidegger also has precious little to say about Hodelin's relation to Romanticism, idealism, and the Enlightenment and revolutionary politics. Yet the silence with respect to Christianity is not simply one silence among others. The silence about Christianity and its claims on Hölderlin is suggested in Heidegger's three-volume interpretation of Nietzsche, where he seems resolute in avoiding as much as possible any discussion of Nietzsche's relation to Christianity, as if despite the constitutive nature of Nietzsche's anti-Christian rhetoric, this is an inessential feature of his thought that can be ignored. This is more strategy than tactic of omission. One intended to make Christianity less potent by depriving it of a voice and the prospect of answering back. Not to recognize revelation as a happening or event or the happening or the event uh, is more powerful than global uh, critique. Should revelation emerge into appearance. Not only will it find itself that it's without historical rights, but it also functions as something of an anachronism. It simply is a monstrous nothing, entirely misshapen, the nightmare from which both Joyce and the Gospel of Truth suggest we should awake. Philosophy or myth is the last feature. The final feature of Heidegger's conjugation of myth and philosophy in the wars of the 1930s and 40s concerns the ambiguity of the relative status in his work of myth and philosophy. It would be easy to think that Heidegger's work in this period simply involves a regression to myth, as was the judgment of Lovit and Adorno, among others. Yet this does not quite capture the relative formality of how myth functions in Heidegger. At once a finely etched hierogamy and a philosophical discourse equally sibilant to match. For Heidegger, for example, it is a compliment to call Heraclitus' thinking obscure. And certainly post-metaphysical -metaphys thinking is representative, though of what uh, it, and how it is not altogether clear. Still, it should not be ignored, no matter what the line of vector of interpretation, it inevitably uh, compels uh, going into the other. If you start with myth, you're going to need philosophy. If you start with philosophy, you're going to, going to need myth. Now, this, throughout this period, we see that precisely in those texts that have the look of repristination, Heidegger can also uh, be seen to translate myth into a post-metaphysical idiom. If we ignore the obvious destination of the process of translation, that is normally when we talk about demythologization, we could almost, uh, with Boltman, talk about demythologization, a prospect that is supported by the close relationship between Heidegger and Boltman in his Marburg years before being in time. <coughs> Well, of course, as I said, almost. Almost intimates a condition that is not met. First, of course, we would be ignoring the fact that for Heidegger, scientific discourse always fails to illuminate reality and deepen human existence. And second, we would have failed to observe the phenomenon of the double discursive movement in Heidegger. That is, the descending movement of thinking towards mythic forms of thought and civilization that affect a rematologization of philosophy and thereby saves it from its worst rationalistic instincts, and the ascending movement of translation of myth into a post-metaphysical idiom that in the end appears to be ultimate. 
Looking at Heidegger's, just to sum up, looking at Heidegger's texts from the 1930s and 1940s, it seems evident that the engagement of philosophy and myth rules out the possibility of a productive and positive relationship with Christian revelation, though not necessarily uh, an encounter with religion altogether, and especially with regard to those non-Christian forms of religion or religiousness, which do not involve a distinction between the world and the divine. Texts such as contributions and Heidegger's interpretation of Hölderlin's poems and the work also of other poets, broadly in the romantic tradition to which Heidegger occasionally refers, suggests that beyond the proscription of metaphysics, which is the one that we're most familiar with, there is also a proscription of biblical and ethical monotheism. This corresponds to the obsessive as well as virulent nature of Heidegger's attacks on Christianity in the Black Notebooks. In such a context, perhaps one ought not to make as much of Heidegger's famous lecture in 1954 on the relationship between philosophy and theology as Protestant theologians made of it. They're assuming that biblicism makes them a protected species, and it does not. Turning now to diagnosing the form, describing the form of myth in Heidegger, and there's a little bit of compare and contrast. I was going to do it with both Kassira and Ricoeur, but I think so if no for your attention span, we can ex recur and obviously there are probably recurrence around, and uh, you can sort of ask a question in due course. Having spoken about the return of myth in Heidegger's thinking in the 1930s and 1940s, the obvious question concerning its basic form arises. Since Heidegger neither admits to such a return nor provides a language of analysis of myth, one is forced to have recourse to the vocabularies of analysis supplied by other thinkers in the 20th century with whom Heidegger would profoundly disagree. I'm thinking, among others, of Bultmann, Kassir, Jaspers, whom Heidegger engages, and others such as Verdlin and Ricoeur, who respond to him in in indirect and direct ways. In any event, in these thinkers, there exists a variety of vocabularies of analysis coupled with contrasts uh, between types. So, for example, compact and differentiated myth, non-broken and broken myth, organic and artificial myths, non-speculative and speculative myth, etc. Given the particular origins and the different interests observed, at best these vocabularies are approximate to each other and not, and not fully substitutable. Nonetheless, if not from a theoretical point of view, at least from a rhetorical point of view, I would like to keep all of these in play in order to provide an adequate kind of adequate description of myth, as is operative but not thematized in contributions and other texts of Heidegger from the same period. It is necessary as a preliminary to scope, so, let's see, throughout my emphasis will be on the second of the two pairs, that is, uh, broken myth, differentiated myth, um, that's probably so, the, those are my two favorite terms. Though my emphasis will be on the second of the two pairs, given the pervasiveness of Heidegger's narrative of declension, it is necessary as preliminary to scope out the first, as it is the basis of the worlding and community-creating impact of compact, undifferentiated, and unbroken myth that Heidegger moves to insinuate uh, in the fourfold and hierogamy as an alternative to the nihilistic galloping of reason towards its faded demise in modernity or as modernity. Now in, this, in an expressly philosophical work such as Introduction to Philosophy, as well as his interpretive work on Nietzsche, Heidegger harps continually on the ruptural quality of the emergence of classical philosophy in Plato and Aristotle and laments it somewhat after the manner of a Greek chorus. What the likes of Werner Jaeger or Paul Friedlander would hallow as one of humanity's greatest, greatest achievements, according to Heidegger, sets human beings fatally on the wrong path. 
Indeed, the wrong path is nothing less than fate, a trajectory that is destined and irreversible despite the manifest appearance of human freedom and purposeful agency that could be called on to reverse what appears, what appears to have the signs of a beginning or at the beginning of a, a human uh, contingent decision. That is, if it is the case that the original fall sort of, you know, was brought in by human freedom, then surely sort of, there is a reversal of it. A human sort of, you know, freedom can also reverse it, which of course I'm suggesting is denied by Heidegger. First, however, we must characterize uh, the event of the emergence of reason as nothing less than the fall. Not really, we have a kind of Christian narrative. Reason is the wound that leaves human beings divorced from themselves, their surroundings, and of course, each other. It is also a wound that throughout Western history grows larger and more septic, and eventually will come to regulate all cultures, East and West, and ensure their demise. And in contradistinction to Hegel, the wound of reason is not the wound that will heal itself. What we have established thus far is, A, that while Heidegger points to a way of thinking, being, and belonging that contrasts with the Western history of philosophy, which as a history of reason is a history of violence against both what perhaps once was and perdures as a marginal phenomenon throughout Western history. And be that in general, Heidegger deals with broken forms of myth that intimate a kind of integrative horizon that is aboriginal and which we might approximately refer to as the arena of compact, organic, or unbroken myth, where discourse, practice, and form of life are absolutely of a piece. A number of questions arise. First, does Heidegger, in contributions and other texts in the period that concern us, instantiate in his discourse the unbroken or, or undifferentiated myth uh, that is merely intimated in and by pre-Socratic thought in Hölderlin? Or contrarywise, does he also repeat the broken nature of myth that does not fully enact what it intimates? Second, does Heidegger's use of the fourfold, as well as readings of the pre-Socratics in Hölderlin, rule out the prospect, however terrible to him, that in his case, myth is not simply broken, but speculative and pedagogic, perhaps after the manner of Plato. The two questions are obviously related, though perhaps only the first admits of a clear answer. The most plausible answer regarding the first question is that though Heidegger repeats broken myths that either invoke or evoke something more primordial, that is, unbroken myth. He does so in a more reflective register that at once gives him an advantage in filling out the myth that is now fragmented and disadvantages him in that as the level of, re of reflection increases, which it really does performatively in his text, so also the level of distanciation between his discourse and the discourses that ideally he would excavate and recommend. With regard to the second question, perhaps it might prove useful to move towards an answer towards <clears throat> the relationship between Heidegger's thinking of philosophical thinking and myth on the one hand, and Ernst Cassirer's thinking on the other. As is well known, Kassira and Heidegger have a checkered history, with Davos being the crystallizing point of previous disagreements concerning the nature of philosophy and its relation to symbol and myth, as well as a catalyzing point towards suspending dialogue, given the fundamental nature of the differences. In other words, there's no need for any more conversation. Uh, as Dickinson would say, we've hit bedrock, and therefore we can't communicate any longer with each other. Neocantian as he was, Cassirer showed himself comfortable in his three volume philosophy of symbolic forms with a history of symbolic or mythic representations of reality and felt inclined to give testimony to their value as anticipations of reflective consciousness that overcame their inadequacies relative to the critical nature of reason. <clears throat> 
It being understood, of course, that critical reason is human beings' best bet in terms of being adequate to the real. As one might expect in such a near Kantian thinker, a sharp divide is posited between representation and thinking, or myth and philosophy. And clearly, this does not match up with Heidegger's ruminations on a better performance of the relation between myth and philosophy that characterizes these texts of the 1930s and 40s. So the comparison might suggest that these thinkers have not, nothing in common. The matter, as it turns out, is made complicated by the fact that while Heidegger precisely does not segregate myth from his post-metaphysical thinking, like Kant, and perhaps to a limited extent, Kersira, he does allow a measure of translation of the fourfold and hierogamy into thought, as long as neither is translated into the language of metaphysics. Crucially, this post-metaphysical, idiosyncratic language is presumed to both contain and surpass broken myth or myths that are its presupposition. We are then thinking, or rather dealing, I think, in the Heidegger of the 1930s and 40s with the privilege of non-mythological non thought, at least in the final instance. Arguably, this brings Heidegger closer to Kassir's position in that myth could be thought to move towards the condition of pedagogy, that is, of being illustrative of a form of thinking that exceeds it, even as it also redresses the rationalism of the history of philosophy. Still, honesty requires that the gap between Heidegger and Kassir cannot finally be closed, since the thinking acclaimed by Heidegger is not reason disconnected from myth and symbolic discourse, but one, rather, that has been basted in it. The third section now, sort of, of this first part is this contrast between Heidegger and German idealism with regard to status of revelation on the one hand, and then the relation between revelation and myth and philosophy on the other. Christianity's insistence on the integrity of revelation it turns out is, ironically, anyone who knows me writing about Heidegger was, will note, ironically, as sponsored by German idealism, with which, uh, substantively, Heidegger routinely takes issue. In different ways and to different extents, Hegel and Schelling made the relation between philosophy and myth a broad theme, even as both attempted uh, throughout their philosophical careers to triangulate with revelation that for both proved pivotal. For the early Hegel, myth was both reality and aspiration. Regarding the former, myth was less a freestanding category than a recollection of pre-Christian forms of thought other than Judaism that had an integrating function in that discourse both regulated and reflected its deep interconnection to behavior, form of life, and community identity. And given the rampant Philhellenism, Philhellenism abroad in German high culture since Winkelmann, and routinely espoused in German Romanticism, the Greek community was regarded as exemplary. And regarding the latter, that is, aspiration, the ambition of the early Hegel is to construct a mythology of reason, that is, construct a form of discourse that would be fully comprehensive, but which would also connect with behavior and form of life, and thus would represent a cure for the fragmentation of discourse of modern life and the enemy of modern social existence. In the mature Hegel, without the Greek community ceasing to be an exemplar of sorts, it comes to be best understood as a form that demands a non-identical repetition in late modernity, in and through, in this instance, a critical and speculative understanding or misunderstanding of the truth of Christianity that serves as its possibility even if much of historical Christianity is dispensed with, and the positivity or brute fact rendering of revelation corrected. The aspiration of the myth of reason, though long in coming, can be seen to be fulfilled in the articulation of the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences, which articulates a self-producing and reproducing set of categories that in principle apply to all that was is, and despite revisionist 
Hegel interpreters appalled at Hegel's ambition also applies to all that will be. Turning to Schelling. In early Schelling, the connection between myth and reason takes the form of articulating the relationship between art and philosophy. In the text of Schelling's middle period, the relation is more nearly performed and thematized in that in texts such as the essay on human freedom and the ages of the world, Schelling's explorations of the divine, divine and the divine world and human relations proceeds in and through an interpretation, though hidden from sight, uh, of the Lutheran theosophist Jakob Böhme, who focuses on the becoming of God and under that auspices speaks to both angst and darkness as a condition of theogenesis. In the final, the final period of philosophical production, after a long, long silence, Schelling produces his philosophy of myth, which reflectively surpasses anything produced by Hegel on the topic and demonstrates an empathy with mythic worlds and types that Hegel in his progressivist and more rationalistic scheme fails to match. Now, while my main intent is to reflect on the differences between Hegel and Schelling and Heidegger, and especially with regard to the operative functioning of the category of revelation, it is important to point out with regard to the relation between myth and philosophy that Heidegger owes a great deal to each. I begin with Hegel. As is well known, Hegel is ambassador by Heidegger for putting an exclamation point on philosophy's Promethean urge to be the discourse of everything and to effect a logical and ontological foundation for all thought that rinses time of chance and history of its contingency. In light of his foundationalism, Hegel's thought no less than Cartesian and Leibnizian ancestors represents a supreme instance of, as we well know, onto theology or onto theology. Thus, the continued denunciation of Hegelian logos as a form of absolute knowledge and the proscribing of encyclopedic uh, pretension. Yet affirmation also abounds. First, however improbably and however philosophically unjustified, Heidegger actually ascribes greatness to Hegel despite his consummation of the closure of metaphysics. There are a number also, there are, there are also a number of particular features of Hegel's thought that he admires, other than Hegel's almost maniacal boldness that dares to bring light, dares to bring to light the dream of philosophy. First, on a more formal level, Heidegger approves of the hermeneutic nature of Hegel's philosophical thought that does not pretend to be presuppositionalist. This opens up the space of dialogue between philosophy and mythic and symbolic forms of thought. And second, Hegel's articulation of the notions of community and ethos continue to have merit in Heidegger's writings in the 1930s and 1940s. His texts of choice, however, are not Hegel's early writings in which Hegel elaborated the notions of community and ethos, or, or rather nor, Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of religion in which Hegel speaks to Christianity as their realization, but rather Hegel's philosophy of right, Despite Hegel's underscoring the fundamental Christian suppositions of both in the modern world, Heidegger passes over in silence and reads both as, as task and as reality, one that demands of Germany the fundamental courage to be and to insinuate a prophetic alternative to the side of liberal democracy, but also, and crucially, uncontaminated by Christianity. And third and relatedly, Hegel continues the pattern begun by Kant and given air once again in Heidegger's work in the 1930s and 40s of thinking of Judaism and Catholicism as being particularly socially pernicious in that both encourage constructions of a divine order that negate and alienate human beings and make genuine community impossible. Turning now to Schelling, while overall Schelling is not excluded from his account of the fall of philosophy or radical thinking into metaphysics. Heidegger does not quite hoist Schelling on this petard, at least not to the same extent as he does Hegel. One of the forms it takes is simply to talk about the movement of metaphysics from Hegel to Nietzsche without adducing as Schelling's name at all. In terms of positives, however, Schelling shares some overlapping features with Hegel of which Heidegger can approve. And these include the interpretive nature of philosophy, that in a text such as system of transcendental idealism as art, which functions as myth, as a basic supposition. The interpre 
interpretation of reality as both kinesis, genesis, and agon, as well as the way in which these features are reflected in what Heidegger would refer to as Dasein. And arguably in both cases, Schelling represents an improvement on Hegel. When thinking of the relation between philosophy and art, like Hegel, Schelling establishes the hierarchy. Yet the hierarchy is far less stable than in the case of Hegel, since Schelling seems to valorize genius and imagination and poetics in a way that Hegel does not. In addition, what Heidegger most admires about the Schelling of the Middle Period is the emphasis upon freedom as anarchic and disconnected from reason. The differences, however, between both of the German idealists and Heidegger are profound when it comes to revelation. For both, while revelation bears intimate relations with myth, in both its religious and artistic expression, and with philosophy, insofar as it serves as a presupposition for it, it is, in fact, a genuine third, indeed, a mediating third, in the case of Hegel, this means, among other things, that by the time of the phenomenology, Christianity as revealed religion surpasses the illuminations provided by Greek religion in general and Greek tragedy in particular, that had Herlalen in thrall and Heidegger even more bewitched, insofar as he does not show the German romantics' poetic ambivalence with respect to Greek religion and Christianity, but unilaterally decides that is Heidegger in favor of the Greek over the Christian. Hegel also insists that the theological expression of revelation and doctrines such as the Trinity, creation, fall, incarnation, history, church, and eschaton provide the proximate data for philosophy to work its magic or translation into a purely conceptual language adequate to reality, while also having built in, in, into this a dialectical language of a logic of justifications, both first and second order. It is not a little interesting that even when Heidegger is at his most critical of Hegel, he shows little interest in reminding the reader of Hegel's commitment to Christianity in general and Revelation in particular. For example, in his two reflections on the ph phenomenology in the 1930s, when speaking of the terminus of the voyage of individual and historical social consciousness towards absolute knowledge, Though Heidegger is comfortable describing the goal in the Christian apocalyptic language of the parousia, Hegel's actual deaths to Christianity are never mentioned. It is as if uh, Hegel's philosophy is misbegotten insofar as on, entirely on its own recognizance, it has a sense of an ending uh, rather, than, rather than that it has, in fact, become derailed because of dependence on Christian theological categories and the insistence that revelation is the subtext of philosophy and essentially makes it possible, which is Hegel's position. It is not a moment to Heidegger to analyze the actual extent to which Heidegger, rather Hegel, shows that Christianity provides philosophy with both form and content and equally the extraordinary effort uh, made, uh, extraordinary effort at that philosophy needs to make in order to gain independence from Christianity in precisely in and through the process of translation. That is, Heidegger fails to take account of the fact that in Hegel, the hermeneutic nature of philosophy, which at first indicates a stance of gratitude to the given, instantiates in the end a stance of ingratitude insofar as it is in conceptual thought that Christianity ultimately finds its explanation and its sanction. I'm going to come to the end of this particular section. Crucially, more than in the case of Hegel, what divides Schelling from, Schelling's from Heidegger is the importance and pervasiveness of the category of revelation. Obviously, the crux of this separation in Schelling's work is provided by his later philosophy, in which not only does philosophy simply have to accept existence as a given, it's also required to accept Christianity as event. The eventual or apocalyptic nature of revelation is to the fore in both versions of the philosophy of revelation. The task of philosophy is to attempt to catch up with that which is given in the event of revelation gratefully and graciously. This task is essentially hopeless. Though revelation is not assert, neither can it be adequately and comprehensively explained. It is intelligible just as creation is and demands interpretation, 
but this interpretation is in principle endless. Of course, uh, in the late Schelling, the discussion of revelation occurs in a philosophical context in which there is a monumental treatment of myth as a holistic discourse in which human beings uh, lie outside, human beings outside the order of revelation. Um, and the fact is that myth and revelation relate, and myth and revelation are ultimately also absolutely distinct because revelation sort of is an absolute vertical shift away from myth. Now I'm going to do sort of the last part of the paper is just a brief sort of dealing uh, with sort of uh, the Christian and Augustinian response to the erasure of revelation. I know I'm going a little bit over time, but I just want to, how do we answer from the outside rather than provide a, some kind of description from the inside? From the, 20th, from the 17th century on, Christian thinkers had little chance but to respond to but to respond to the challenges regarding the hinged notion of revelation, whether the challenge was that of deism or in due course actual atheism, the challenge of semi-rationalism that effectively downsized the notion uh, and or proposed to translate the crude legal and narrative language uh, of the Bible into another idiom, sometimes moral, sometimes scientific, sometimes speculative. There was rage and there was trolling Pascal against Descartes, Haman against Kant, Jacobi against Lessing, uh, Stillingfleet against Locke, uh, Kierkegaard against Hegel, and there was also plenty of telling argument, Newman against Locke and Waitley, Kuhn against uh, Kant, Staudelmeier against Hegel. For 20th and 21st century Christianity, Heidegger's prevarications regarding revelation present just one more challenge on the one hand, but also, I suppose, a unique one. Since in two different registers, he seems to both affirm and deny Christianity. In being in time, we catch Heidegger translating rather than entirely getting rid of key aspects of revelation, such as its event or unanticipatable quality and its fundamentally shocking and transformative capacity. Despite the bevy of Christian apologists, now and then, the transformation was noted by Heideggerians, by Heideggerian initiates such as Lovett, uh, and Jonas, and Catholic theologians, philosophers such as Chavar and Stein, and that in real time. And in our own time, by Jean de Marion and Lacoste, nor is Balthasar, nor was Balthasar fooled, though he entertained with others the belief that perhaps under some circumstances, Heidegger might be thought to have saved, at least in part, some Christian appearances. Christian thinkers have been slower to deal with the work of the later Heidegger, Albeit, with different, albeit for different reasons. At one level, this is because the work of the, of the later Heidegger is simply strange, an enigma wrapped in the mystery or vice versa that can be grasped almost as a new scripture excavated from discourses, nominally Greek, that precede Christianity, or a discourse of and from the future. More closely looked at, however, texts such as contributions and elucidations suggest a deep engagement with Christianity in general and revelation in particular. Still, it has not only uh, been commentators on Heidegger, but Christian theologians such as Balthasar and Shivara, who have captured the oddity of the discourse of the later Heidegger, which in its very paganism indicates nonetheless his deep affinities with, with Christian thought. Not that they are naive enough to suppose that Christianity emerges unscathed from this new context of its placement and uh, new context of replacement, which fundamentally revise, revises just about everything fundamental to the notion of revelation. What I've tried to do, show in these, uh, this paper, is how the very basic concept of revelation is altered in, Heidegger's, in Heidegger, first by being made subaltern in being in time, and subsequently effectively squeezed out by myth, or by both myth and philosophy together in their very dynamic relation. Now, while Christianity's negotiation with the discourses, cultural discourses throughout Western history has been both complicated and varied, nonetheless, throughout this long history, it has dealt with both myth and philosophy and attempted to triangulate the relationship with revelation. Origen uh, was very much inclined in this direction, though it is Clement of Alexandria, uh, Stromata, that provides the classic example, I think, of the early centuries. Revelation is productively and positively related to both myth and philosophy. Throughout this history, this very lowercase c, Catholic way of seeing revelation in the context of its relation to myth and philosophy 
has allowed for a variety of interpretations, not all of which were calculated to maintain the absolute integrity of revelation. One can think of the Renaissance thinkers such as Ticino and Pico del Mandola, a variety of English and German romantics who in good faith and bad aim to correct revelation by appeal to and use of philosophy and, re and refurbish revelation by an appeal to myth. Nonetheless, Clement is not untypical in his expansiveness and in his triangulation of revelation with myth and philosophy. The revelation also provides a critical measure and functions to pick out and reject different forms of myth in which either God or man are figured in ways that do not match the elevated view of the divine and the human in the biblical text, and as well pick out deficient forms of philosophy such as Epicureanism and Cynicism. And just about a page or two uh, on Augustine to end, so they know who is my hero, but I'm not going to deal with him very much. Augustine, too, is a triangulator of revelation, myth, and philosophy, the one in which revelation's critical measure has been exacerbated. If Augustine's openness to cultural production is a basic feature of his early work, De Doctrina Christiana makes a decisive change insofar as it insists on the prerogatives of revelation, in particular, its rights to vet and judge, and to appropriate or expropriate on its own terms what is valuable in both myth and philosophy. The city of God can be seen as a focused application of this hermeneutic posture insofar as revelation and then the elaborate theology which it inspires functions to judge other relevant ways of understanding reality and bringing to language in myth and philosophy. Or in Augustine's terms, it illuminates as it also criticizes mythical and mythical and natural forms of theology. The issue for Augustine is the adequacy of representation, which given the exemplary function of gods, has real effects on how human beings conduct their lives. The gods of myth are, in the strict sense, fabulous. Whether we are talking about supreme gods or the gods that occupy and define the interval between the supreme god and the world, who in a sense represent the adhesive between the two distinct planes of existence. Without, un without unveiling the daemonic as a category. Augustine in books six to 10 of the City of God uh, labels these gods as demonic, but as he also ferrets out the deficiencies of supreme God, the supreme God such as Jupiter, given to license, but it also seems to be as much an effect of the demonic world as its cause. In any event, in light of, light of good sort of moral sense, but especially in light of the Christian theological discourse that has developed out of Revelation, Neither the demonic sphere, uh, uh, the demonic sphere, or the sphere of the higher gods succeed, uh, rather give kind of succor to Christians. Augustine's diagnosis and critique of this demonic sphere is particularly relevant in finding a Christian contestation of Heidegger's invention of a intermediate and intermediating divine human sphere that would relativize the singular nature of Christ Christ's redeeming role and his healing of what is broken in human beings. Christ is not one way uh, among others, uh, as is the case sort of, you know, with the plurality of Greek gods, and also in the case of, also that's Hulam would have it. Nor can the demonic plane be substituted for Christ in its function uh, to tie the knot, as it were, between the divine and the human, bringing the divine down and bringing the human up. In my last paragraph. In the city of God, there is no absence of admiration for philosophy, especially no absence, rather, admiration for philosophy, especially Platonic philosophy and the figure of Socrates. The humanness of even Platonic philosophy is essential, while the all too human nature of other modes of philosophy come into view. Even so, or especially, Neoplatonic philosophy is not exempt. Porphyry, in particular, is singled out. Interestingly, one of the contaminating features is something like the inscription in philosophy of the demonic plane that in this case encourages, that in this case seems to get encouraged, or encourages rather, encourages theurgy. Augustine then seems to be alert and to alert us to the complex phenomenon that we observed in the Heidegger of the 1930s and 40s. That is, the substitution of revelation by a demonic sphere of the between and the rendering of philosophy, or philosophia, 
that's beholden to, if not entirely enthralled to, this demonic sphere of between. I'm here more interested in the diagnostic capacity of Augustine's treatment of the mythical and natural theology than with its adjudicative and polemical power. I think of it as a powerful, I think of it as powerful and just one, one other way in which Augustine, whom, Heid, whom Heidegger rails against in his pre-being in time writings, relativizes in being in time and makes disappear in the work of the 1930s and 40s, can answer back, can gain a critical grip against Heidegger and enable us to get a critical grip. Prayer and liturgy on this account belong neither to the province of myth nor philosophy, but solely and properly to the order of revelation with this incalculable and solicitous God who only becomes readable in the incarnation and the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for going over. All right, so we have about 17 minutes for questions. Um, the mic is going to be put just right there. And so if you have any questions, please just come up to the mic. And, and uh, Professor Regan will just continue to sit at, uh, stand at the podium. Oh, all right. I just have a brief. Just what you're mentioning, and thank you for that wonderful paper. Uh, I really appreciated the the sort of what I heard as secularizing maneuvers of the um, the erasure substitution elision. I, I like that, and it was just at the tail end there that it perked up for me. Uh, and I wondered if you could say a bit more about that connection you're making between those 1921 uh, lectures on Augustine and the Neoplatonists uh, in the phenomenology of religious life, and sort of how you're seeing that. Uh, you, you mentioned it just at the tail end of the paper, and if you had more canvas or whatever, could you sort of flesh out, sure. is there a genuine shift there, or is, is, is that sort of the pattern that's emerging from those lectures on into the later Heidegger, as you're saying? Right. I think in the 1921 lectures, uh, there is this sort of encounter with Augustine, a granting sort of that in his, albeit deficient theological language, or committed Christian language, uh, he sort of is unveiling some important elements of factical life. That would be the language he'd be using at that particular point. But however, uh, this, that these, uh, the virtue sort of, you know, of, the virtue of this kind of disclosing sort of of these measures of uh, the questioning sort of self, the ecstatic self, uh, these are doused uh, and these sort of are uh, ultimately sort of entirely contaminated, in this instance, not by Christianity, but, but by sort of a platonic metaphysics. And that then, I think, sort of gives you sort of a, an anticipation of how Augustine is treated in being in time. So when we look at being in time, so there really are two theological uh, sources sort of which are mentioned. Uh, that's Kierkegaard and Augustine. So there's an echo sort of of the 1921 text. But this particular point, sort of, since he has actually sort of made his peace with Augustine, and Augustine now, sort of, and thinking of later on, will be sort of part of the metaphysical tradition uh, that used as a pejorative. These are, shall we say, sort of the the residuals, the, the existential residuals uh, of um, of Augustine, so that they can sort of be echoed. That was, if you like, the result of what the only thing you can get from Augustine is uh, you can get these sort of indications of, of what sort of a pure, a really. Um, a serious phenomenological ontology is going to deliver. Once that's done, Heidegger, uh, Heidegger inscribes um, Augustine in the metaphysical tradition. He doesn't tend after that sort of you know, to kind of point to texts as he does sort of in you know, 1921, sort of with different texts. Uh, you know, he's going to point to confessions, he's going to point sort of to a deterrentate, and I think so he points to the commentary on Psalms. So then there's going to be a textual allusion. He has done his business sort of with Augustine. And Augustine sort of then, somewhat like, I think Augustine more than Aquinas uh, functions as a proxy with respect to what sort of you know, a Christian kind of philosophy is going to look like. So there isn't a fantastic amount sort of of discussion sort of of Thomas, uh, 
other than sort of a, on occasions, there's going to be an analysis you know, of sort of essence and existence, which presumably sort of Thomas sort of you know, has laid out. Uh, but despite sort of you know, Catholic thinkers always and everywhere sort of kind of tending to think, well, does Heidegger agree with Thomas or can he be a supplement to Thomas or not? Uh, the real encounter, I think, sort of you know, is prior, and that is sort of you know, with, with uh, Augustine. And Augustine sort of had been put to bed sort of by 1927. Uh, and sort of you know, that putting to bed, I think, sort of you know, is pretty absolute. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir. I apologize. I was a bit late. I got the time wrong. I thought it was 5.30, but I'm a belated <laughs> arrival. But just a, a question about the last uh, thing about the daimonic in Augustine and, uh, and, uh, and um, Heidegger also. You know, again, whatever Augustine says, uh, I'm just kind of wondering whether the daimonic can also be, in a sense, rescued from approbation or disapprobation, rather, and wondering if the sense of the daimonic that's at stake there with, August, with, uh, with Aquinas, or not Aquinas, but with, with Heidegger, and perhaps even with Augustine too, is a catonic sense of the daimonic, that is to say, a sense of the betweening of the powers and human power that comes from below up. But by contrast, a Uranian sense of the daimonic, which has a more vertical transcending uh, to the heavens. It would be an interesting issue to look at the fourfold in Heidegger, the relation between earth and sky, and ask whether his sense of the daimonic is catonic more prim primarily than Uranian. And I, I'm given to think about it because, again, Augustine is Augustine, and he's a world unto himself, but uh, the Augustinus Hibernicus, mm -hmm. uh, ma as many of you know here, of course, there was a thinker who identified himself with Augustine in the early centuries of Irish Christianity and was called Augustinus Hibernicus. But one of the very interesting things about that time among some of the early Irish Christians was much less antagonistic attitude towards the older religion. It wasn't euhemeristic, and it wasn't also daimonizing in a way that sometimes the Latin church tended to do. There was a sort of more, more, more companioning transition, so to say, from the old gods to the new god of Christianity. And I've often wondered whether Heidegger, strangely enough, is more Latin in seeing the hostility of the Christian and the pagan rather than Hibernian mm -hmm. in the sense that I'm indicating here. And I've wondered also if it has to do with the Catonic mm -hmm. and the Uranian, the difference between a landlocked thinker in the neighborhood of the Black Forest as opposed to an insular thinker on an island. If you're on an island, it's both inwardly turned it's also outwardly turned. But the winds of the ocean will always be blowing across the island. The sense of anotherness from a beyond will always freshen the air over the island, over the island. Whereas in the case of the landlocked thinker, you don't get those winds, at least not quite in the same sense. And I wonder if these elemental things could be, as it were, said to a Heidegger from a, the standpoint of a, a Hibernian Augustine, so to say. Sure. Right, that's a great question, and it's a multivalent question as well, so I won't deal with all, all aspects of it, William. Um, perhaps I would start, sort of, you know, by making a distinction between two ways in which one sort of, let's say, the demonic comes into discourse. One way to come into discourse is that in order to give the most fulsome account you know, of reality in which, let's say, we have the world and ourselves as one of the poles and the supreme God sort of as another pole, um, there just sort of is a permissiveness with respect sort of you know, to that there are things that occur sort of which do not necessarily sort of you know, seem sort of you know, to be events coming from the Supreme God, and at the same time seem to be more sort of you know, than who we take ourselves to be sort of you know, at any given time. So what I would say is that the demonic can come into sort of come into our discourse in and through this avenue sort of you know, of overflooding, that is that 
who are not in the business sort of, you know, of denying or segregating reality or making judgments about sort of, you know, the, the probities sort of elements of reality. The second form is the demonic as a reaction formation. I mean, Heidegger, and I think you named him in any event, so I think we're, we're speaking sort of the same language. The demonic comes into Heidegger only because Heidegger wants to get rid of an ultimate god. So, so the, function, the function is a substitution function. And because of the substitution function, I mean, obviously, I, sort of, I then use Augustine against it because Augustine is worried about idolatry. That is, it's not just, it's not just simply whether, as a matter of fact, we might experience things so there's no which are between. That reality gives itself as it gives itself. It's what kind of claims we're going to make with respect to it. Uh, and are we sort of going to make the claim so that this intermediating reality is, in fact, reality, or are we going to pres prescribe that, it, that this uh, reality can, can, this reality is alone the divine reality and therefore will foreclose with respect to sort of anything like Christian monotheism or Jewish monotheism. The second form is not operative in Heidegger. It's not a matter sort of of permission, it's a matter sort of, you know, of using a divine, pluralizing a divine, amorphizing a divine in order that in every which way you're going to actually have a substitution sort of, you know, for God. So um, Augustine, I think, provides sort of you know, a kind of then, I mean, he doesn't, it's not intentionally, but I think he provides us a way of distinguishing sort of between um, the demonic sort of as substitution and the demonic as a letting be. And I think that's, that's what you're saying, sort of, I think, in terms of you know, the Hibernian. That is, it's allowed, uh, but you're not actually then coming to a status, and because it's allowed, therefore, uh, the one who's above all things sort of you know, is now going to be dismissed. So I take it if uh, Arugina is going to be sort of you know, your Hibernian example, that you know not without sort of not without dangers of panentheism and all kinds of things sort of you know, in in his major work, uh, I take it that would be an example uh, of where sort of you know, in reality um, there are things sort of which appear that um, the epiphanies occur. Epiphany is always going to be in some sense a theophany in that landscape, but. You know, epiphany and theophany don't necessarily have to have the same charge as the once and once only events sort of, you know, of the incarnation, sort of in the passion death of Christ and so forth. So I, th I think sort of that particular demonic as the letting be of things sort of you know, more than human and but most certainly not identified in the last instance with God. But I think sort of with respect to that distinction, it's quite clear sort of you know, what's happening sort of in Heidegger. It is substitution, and substitution all the way through. We have time for one more brief question and a brief response. Anyone? Ryan, please come to the. Yeah. Thank you, Professor O'Regan. A brilliant lecture. I have a brief question. So it appears that there's three ways of interpreting myth and the value of myth. On the one hand, we have for Schelling a purely passive following upon the eventality of myth that doesn't offer any firm criteria for distinguishing good and bad myths. On the other hand, it, for Heidegger, there's a negative evaluation of Christianity that arises from the suspicion that it doesn't ask the most original questions of being. It doesn't perform the appropriate transcendental analysis of being. But you're recommending a third one, and I want to understand what would be the appropriate evaluative criteria for distinguishing the demonic and bad myth from the, the angelic or the felicitous myth. That's and right. in what sense can we, internal to those myths themselves, find a, a basis for rejecting Heidegger's mythos? Right. Um, formally speaking, uh, and it will turn out so that there's a relation of the substance to the, to the form, um, the, form, the, form uh, the form of critique is provided by revelation. Though, of course, revelation isn't just simply a brute fact. Uh, it has got to do sort of, you know, with uh, an event that sort of is attested to sort of you know in scripture and that is interpreted throughout sort of you know a 2000 year tradition. Uh, and of course then sort of that tradition is going to vet sort of all kinds of things including sort of shall we say the moral or super moral capabilities sort of you know of the gods of whom we praise uh, and the gods to whom sort of you know we are obedient. Uh, 
So the formal answer is, is that uh, Christian Revelation sort of will provide sort of, you know, the machinery in and through which sort of, you, know, you can distinguish between sort of, you know, forms of appearance uh, which sort of seem sort of, you know, not to be kind of reducible immediately sort of, you know, to uh, the cosmic sort of other human. So uh, in my own view, I, I really, I mean, if you don't accept, if you don't accept that, if you don't accept the category of Revelation, and you don't, accept the, you don't accept its interpretation throughout the tradition, then the answer is you have no uh, criterion. And it is the case, I think, sort of with, um, with Heidegger in particular, and to a large extent, I think, sort of in German idealism as well. Um, there isn't a sense in which there's anxiety. The issue, I think, for Hegel and sort of you know, for, um, for Schelling is the issue sort of as to what discourses can we get locked into and what kind of value other than discursive thought uh, these discourses have. And in addition to that, the second question is, to what extent do we need these more fully fleshed discourses which don't really say what to mean but mean something? Uh, but one anxiety that is not there, it seems to me, uh, is the anxiety sort of with respect to, certainly in Hegel it's not there, at sometimes it's there, I think, sort of with Schelling because he is interested in the problem of evil. But generally speaking, he, he, I think he's still kind of Hegelian enough in the sense that the issue sort of has more nearly got to do with how we come to have a, how we come to have a fully fledged and fruitful kind of philosophical discourse. Is philosophical discourse uh, sui generis and self-standing? Or is it, and this is why I kept repeating and repeating the interpretive nature of philosophy, Philosophy to be philosophy needs to interpret something, philosophy, and since it cannot interpret itself, or it interprets itself only in and through interpreting other discourses. And therefore, the legion of discourses which are delivered sort of new to humanity sort of new over millennia, those discourses will function sort of as partial truths, as adumbrations of. And we need to have them all in play, whether dialectically or otherwise, right, Hegelian or sort of in, in terms of the way that uh, Schelling sort of uses them. We need them sort of you know, to have, um, if philosophy is to have an echo of flesh, it, it, it has to find that flesh not in itself, but in and through its interpretive operations with respect to discourses which are far more fleshy, far more gnomic, and far less epistemologically clear than it would like to be. So I'd, I'd like to invite everyone to a wine and cheese reception in Pugin. So if you just walk out the door to the right, uh, Pugin will also be on your right. Uh, it's, it's clearly marked. Uh, you're all welcome. And please join me in, in thanking uh, Professor Regan for an absolutely fantastic uh, lecture this evening. Thank you.